And uh, I get to come up here and talk about Romans 9. So if you have a Bible, you can flip to Romans 9. That's where we're going to be uh, today. But just so you know, I have four kids, and I hear all the time at my house this, this one phrase, it's not fair. That's not fair. Right? And it's usually a little bit more whine than that. Yeah, it's not fair. Right? You hear that at your house sometimes? Have you ever thought that before? Okay, just, you don't have to raise your hands now. It's not fair. And I just want you to know that I think that life is not fair. Uh, I think that I should have been this guy. Put him up there, Aggie, so we can see him. It's not fair. He makes millions of dollars to play a game. And he's apparently pretty good looking from what I've been told. I know he has hair. Um, That's better than I can do. Six foot eight, a monster. And I totally um, wish I was him. You know who that is? Okay, some of you do, good. <laughs> the rest of you are like, who oh, the I killed him. Right, yeah. It's not fair, you know? And, and, you know, I get it. We say this over and over again, life's not fair. I mean, my, when my kids start complaining, they're like, it's not fair. I mean, I got the cool Darth Vader action figure, and my brother has Jar Jar Binks again, you know? Like, well, what are you complaining about? I don't understand why that's not fair. Last night, there was a Nerf war going on in my house, and then the, the fight was, it's not fair. He has the mega dart handheld Nerf gun, and I have to do the blow darts again, you know? I'm like, Dude, you should have bought a mega dart blow dart gun or something. I don't know, you know, I don't know what to tell you. It's just not fair. And, and, you know, and life is just generally not very fair, I, I would guess, for most of us. <laughs> you know, you're just like, man, I just, this isn't great. You know, we work our tails off, trying to do everything we can to make, our in, make ends meet. And then others, they just seem to coast. And you're like, dude, that's not fair, right? Some of us, we really have to work on our relationships. Maybe your marriage. You're like, man, I worked so hard on this marriage. And then you look at the couple next to you and you're like, man, they just got it easy. It's just, that's not fair. I don't understand. And then sometimes, you know, we come up and we got all these physical issues that come in our lives. And you're like, man, my body's breaking down. And here... I look at all the elementary school boys that just went back to Young Oaks, and I'm like, it's not fair. Those kids have energy to spare. Can I have some? Can I tap it, please? Give me the Powerade drink that they drink. I want, it's just, I don't get it. It's just not fair that that, that it's not distributed all equally here. Well, we're constantly, though not always intentionally, comparing what we have and what we are experiencing with those around us, and I think we find ourselves thinking, if not screaming, it's not fair. I know we have many blessings. I mean, I do. I got lots of blessings. I got a great wife. I have awesome kids. I have a nice house that I get to live in. And I get a job that I like to do most of the time. But every now and then we look at stuff around us and we say, man, how does God let this stuff happen? It's not fair. How come people can get away with such crazy behavior? I don't get it. I don't understand. How can they get away with evil? Why does evil things still exist if God is supposedly so loving and and he's such a great God and he's running this show? It's not fair. Why is it that we often come to this point and we say, you know what? It's not just that God is not fair. Well, Paul kind of wants to address that today. We're going to be in Romans chapter 9. Now, through the last couple of chapters of Romans, we've been talking, Paul has been explaining to us and talking about how God's promises have been fulfilled for us. For those that choose to believe, God has fulfilled these promises. And in fact, the church of Jesus Christ has enjoyed many spiritual blessings. Many good things have come for those that are followers of Jesus. Uh, They have the Holy Spirit. They're adopted as God's children. We have a future glory, a future promise awaited for, waiting for us. Uh, we have a promise that we will never be severed from God's love. We've talked about these things the last couple of weeks. Some of you say yes, right? Just Okay, good. I'm making sure that I wasn't making that up. I saw that, right? But now he's asking, man, if all of these promises are fulfilled, he very specifically goes into what does it look like for the historical people of Israel? If these promises are true for for Gentiles, for those that are are in the spiritual uh, family of God, what about these original promises that God made? How is God fulfilling those promises? And how does that relate to all these other promises that we have? How can we trust God for all the things that he has promised us 
And we're not quite sure if God has fulfilled all the promises to the historical people of Israel. So this is who Paul's talking to. He's got to figure it out. So if they're unfulfilled, how can we know that God has done his job here? All right, so Romans chapter 9. This is where we'll start off today. we we'll start in verse 1. Let me find it here. It's in this Bible somewhere. It's in most of your Bibles, just so you know. But mine's right here. Okay. Here he starts off. He starts talking to these guys. He's talking to, the, to his uh, Jewish audience. He wants to explain to them, hey, this is what it's all about. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. <laughs> I think he's trying to say, I promise here, okay? Uh, that my conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. So he starts off here. He's like, man, I, I got this, this, this hurt in my heart, right? I want my brothers. I want all of you people that are listening to me, that are reading my book to understand that I want you to connect with Jesus. And if possible, if it was even so, I would say, hey, I will take your place. I will be accursed in your place. I will be cut off from God in your place so that you might know Christ. Like, man, that's a pretty powerful statement he starts off with here. This is very, very important to Paul. If it is that important, we should kind of pay attention to what he says to the rest of the chapter, all right? This is important. It's important that you connect with Jesus, first and foremost. It's important that you connect with Jesus and so now, it's so important that I'm willing to be cut off myself. I would be willing to take your place, all right? He, now, I can't really do that, all right? So here's what he says instead. Verses 4, he starts off, They are Israelites, the people that I'm will, really longing for here. And to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Look, we have all these promises as Gentiles, as Christians, as people who are following Christ now, but these people, the historical Israelites, have all of these great things have been handed to them. They've been handed the covenants. They've been handed the law. They've been able to worship God originally. They were the ones chosen from the beginning to, to do this, to, to have all of the promises that God has for them. They had the patriarchs who were like the big do deal guys, all right? These are like the godfathers for the Jewish people, all right? These are the, the guys, all right? We, they come from this line. And so they're like, man, there's a lot of good things, good blessings that come from the people of Israel. And most importantly, who comes from the line of the Israelite people? Jesus. He's like, this is good for all of us. These people are blessed and they have been a blessing to us because out of their line comes Jesus. It's all about Jesus again. That's pretty amazing. It happened. All right, it's about Jesus. All right, so he continues on. Six, verse six, but it is not as though the word of God has failed for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. All right, so he sits there, he says, hey, does it look like it's God has failed? Because some of the people that are Jews here are not accepting Christ as their Savior. He says, does that mean that God has failed? And Paul says, no. No, God has done everything he's supposed to do. Some have failed to believe, but God's promises has not failed. There was never a promise that every Jewish person would be saved. So, he sets up two different kinds of Israel here, Paul and his logic problems, okay? And when we read them today, we're like, mm, really? What are you saying, dude? You know, that's not English. And I always say to that, of course not. He wrote in Greek, all right? So if you want to think that this is Greek to you, it is literally Greek to you. So let's look at this Greek logic. He sets up two different Israels here. He sets up two kinds of things here. A historical Israel, the, the physical embodiment of Israel that we see throughout the Old Testament, the kings, you know, David and Solomon and Saul, and, and all of those guys, and Josiah, all those great guys there. And they were chosen to do certain tasks. There were certain things about the historical nation of Israel that accomplished God's promises and his purposes, including they established scripture, 
God gave them the Old Testament, gave them all of the, the, the laws that they were supposed to follow. And eventually the, the Messiah comes from that line as well. But not all of the elect ethnic Israel becomes the saved Israel, the spiritual Israel, according to what Paul is talking about here. So he's saying, hey, there's something else going on here. There was some, the historical Israel, that were elected to certain tasks and that those people had to be born into it. All right? Now, I don't know about you, but for me, I'm out of luck here. I don't get elected into this group. I'm just, that's not, I'm not ethnically Jewish. All right? And a reason to say most of us probably aren't. I mean, this is just how it is. Most of us aren't elected into that because we're not born into this. So we can't be chosen in this group. And so we're kind of out of luck here. But God, in his great mercy, has changed the rules a little bit. And Paul's letting us see it here. He's changed it. He's said, hey, there's a second kind of Israel, the spiritual Israel, the the other set of chosen circumstances, those who have been elected to salvation, those that he has chosen to rescue that are not ethnically Israelites. You with me? Paul, man, Paul makes this so hard. I'm sorry. Here we are. We're not ethnically Israelites, but we are chosen. So we're part of this other part of Israel. If we are chosen to follow Christ, we're this other house of Israel, if you will. Does that make sense? All right. So you have, for those who want to be in this house, you must have faith. That's much easier. Some of you are like, no, it's not. You're right. We have faith when we trust Jesus then we become part of this other house, the spiritual house of Israel then. Then we're chosen. And that's what Paul's setting up here. There's them that were born that way and some that are spiritually saved that way, all right? Now, to be into this latter group, to attain righteousness, all that requires for for those is to have faith in Jesus. Does that sound fair? Yeah. Maybe, but it is consistent. He says, you know, sometimes God chooses them, sometimes he doesn't. For, verse 9, for this is what the promise said. About this time next year, I will return and Sarah shall have a son. He's talking about a, back when he promised Abraham that he was going to have a kid. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children, but one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, She was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. All right, so there's all kinds of stuff going on here. The birth of Esau and Jacob, it's evidence that God can choose people, and some of them get to be in this house, and some don't. He said some of them are over here, some of them are saved, and some are not. He, he, He promised it, and the promise doesn't go to every single Jewish person. If so, then both Esau and Jacob would have been saved. Does that make sense? All right. But they were twins, born with the same mama, same daddy, same time. Well, about the same time, if you know twins work. If you don't know how twins work, ask your mom or dad. All right. But born about the same time, but God chose one and did not choose the other. All right. He, he just, it's how he worked it out. That's what he decided to do. It was nothing that Jacob did because he was chosen before he was born, but God chose him and he achieved his fulfillment in him and, and fulfilled his purpose of election in Jacob. So Christians then can be assured that God's promise will be fulfilled because, not because of why we're born, but because it's entirely up to God's will. So we can trust that we have been rescued. And if we, if we follow Christ, we can trust that that's okay and that fulfills everything that's required because God's will demands it. And some of you are like, but that's not fair. I didn't say it was. I just said that's how God's will works. Sometimes he chooses, sometimes he doesn't. The salvation of anyone at all only comes from God's mercy. All right? The only reason any of us can claim Christ is because of the work that God has done in our lives. These verses may give the impression that God just acts arbitrarily, that he doesn't care about human cooperation at all, that he disregards human freedom no matter what, And so, therefore, he shouldn't have to hold anybody responsible for their own actions. But God's gracious plan does not violate human freedom, okay? And you're like, I thought you just said. I did, all right? The answer is yes, right here, okay? This is a logic problem. Stay with me, all right? So, God's plan doesn't violate human freedom. To select Jacob over Esau reflects that God has a choice, And he chose the nation of Israel to come through Jacob's descendants, not Esau's. 
In saying that he hated Esau, he's not saying that God excluded Esau from his salvation. He's just saying that his redemptive, gracious plan came in the way that he chose, which was through Jacob. He chooses who he wants. Humans have no claim on God. I don't know if you knew that. Your, your God is not a genie in the bottle, all right? As cool as that would be, that's not how it works. God cannot be put in a box. God cannot be told what to do. He is other over all of that. You still with me? All right. And so we can't say God is this. God is bigger than, than our little pot, if you will. All right. He's bigger than that. So on a national level, God sovereignly decided to have mercy on the nation of Israel, including the patriarchs. But his physical children cannot claim that they're automatically saved into this new house of, of, of Israel because they can only be saved by righteousness by having faith in Christ. That's the only way the new, the new house works. But God's gracious election works. It operates in salvation to rescue us. God's determined to save those who trust in Jesus, all right? So all that confusion gets done, well, down to, hey, and some of you could just check the rest of this out. I can see it on your faces, and I get it. I understand. It's confusing. It's Paul. This should be like three sermons, but Mike only gave me one week, so here we go. Uh, so the, the boils down to, to be in the new house of Israel, to be part of the chosen people, we must have faith in Jesus. Are you still with me? you remember that, you'll be good. The rest of it, we'll get into the logic stuff we'll get to. Anyway, but God will have mercy on those he wants to have mercy on. Uh, and it doesn't matter where you come from. Nothing will override what God chooses to do. God desires people to repent and turn to him. So if you've never repented, you've never turned to God, that's what he wants for you. That's the important part. That's what he's looking to give to you today. He's looking for you to say, look, I'm not in charge. I can't do this. That I, it's not fair. God's not fair. But uh, you, God, still know best. And I trust you. And I will follow you. And I will do whatever it takes to obey and to be part of what you're up to. God is just because no one deserves to be saved. None of us. None of you are good enough to deserve it. None of you here are J.J. Watt, right? None of you are that great. And salvation comes by God showing his mercy to us, his grace to us. And that alone is what we can rely on, that he can choose whom he will. Verse 16, he says, So then, it depends not on human will or exertion, not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Like, if you have your own Bible, you should like highlight that verse right there because that's like the ultimate hope right there. It's not about us. It doesn't matter. There's nothing that we can do to earn this. It is God's mercy on us that rescues us, the freedom that God gives us. He saves us. He rescues us. It's all about God's merciful will. So if God is the one that chooses us, why do we have to worry about salvation or repenting or any of that kind of other stuff that comes up? Why do we have to be good people? Well, we don't fully understand everything that's going on, but there's, there is still an element of human responsibility here. There's still a part of it that you have to respond to. The Bible is clear that God wants everyone to repent. He wants everyone to be saved, everyone to come to know the truth and to not perish. But God is sovereign in the matter no matter what. So we trust him to be sovereign. We still choose to repent. We still choose to follow him, right? You still with me, right? We choose to follow him. And his promise is that he will rescue us. And, why does, and he rescues us because he has great, he, he's in charge. He's sovereign. He's got everything under control. He holds the whole world together. Uh, verse 17, it says, For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. He said, look, Pharaoh in the Old Testament was like the ultimate bad guy, all right? This is like Dr. Doom kind of thing, the no good whatsoever. So I mean, Dr. Doom. How about Darth Vader, okay, the ultimate bad guy, and we just got to stay away from this guy, all right? Pharaoh is that guy. That's the imagery you should get in your head. When you see Pharaoh, you're like, oh, dark side, you know, stay away. 
He's like, so God even uses evil. God even uses Pharaoh for his own purposes. God has everything under his control. He's got this. So when your life feels out of control, when it feels like the forces of evil might be overwhelming you, you can trust that God is sovereign and that he still has everything under control. You can know it even if you don't feel it, all right? Trust what you know. Trust what the Bible says over what you feel or experience because sometimes your experience is determined by that nasty pizza that you ate last night, all right? So we got to recognize that. It's for this purpose. He's quoting, God is sovereign over all things. Even the wrath of man will end up praising God. God installed Pharaoh as the ruler, and God hardened his heart so that his power would be seen, so that God's power would be seen by all, and that his glorious name would be spread throughout the whole world. And who can resist his will? Who can, be, who can do this? Verse 19, you will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? Why is it that God still says some of you are, are not part of this? Salvation ultimately depends upon God. He has mercy and he hardens whomever he pleases. How is it then that he can find anyone guilty? How can he cha charge anyone with guilt if his will is irresistible? How is this fair? That's a great question. Verse 20, but who are you? This is Paul's answer to that question, all right? Here's what Paul says to that question. How is this fair? Paul says, but who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? <laughs> who are you, you little ant? You shouldn't stop it. Will, will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? Man, some might expect Paul to say, hey, yeah, we have a choice in this matter here. But instead, he basically says, hey, you're finite. You don't have the whole picture. You don't know what that's for. You don't understand exactly what's going on. He uses this imagery here. This is what? What is this for? No, it's not for cooking. It's a hat, right? It is definitely a hat. Some of you say, no, that's not a hat. That is a drum, right? What else could this be for? A weapon. They said that from the worship leader. It's a weapon, right? This pot is not for cooking. This pot is a weapon. What else? I mean, come on. You can be creative here. What is it? It could, it's a shovel. It could dig. Yes, it's a chair. I can sit on it. The, this pot doesn't get to tell me what it's for, right? That would be absurd. If this pot sat here and started talking, and I looked all over YouTube to try to find a talking pot, and I couldn't find one. But if this pot were to sit here and say, no, dude, I'm for cooking. Put some food in me. We would all say, that's crazy. Talking pots? Who ever heard of such a thing? And if that pot talked to me, we would all have real issues. I would have traumatic issues the rest of my life, but that's another question. You know, I, I, what is it for? It's, it's for whatever use the owner ha decides for it to be for, right? It is a toy for my children. It is a, uh, a, a potting play. You put a plant in it, right, or something. I don't even know, whatever. You know, it, it is for whatever the owner, the one who has made this, determines it to be for. The pot doesn't get to decide. You're the pot. You're the pot. You don't get to decide. It doesn't matter whether it's honorable, dishonorable. God says that some are saved, some are unsaved. Humans are guilty for their sin, and he has no philosophical reason why God chooses who he will. He doesn't say the answer to that question. So the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why he does it that way. Got me. But I trust that he is sovereign, that he still has his everything under control. He knows everything that's going on. He ordains all that happens. But God does not sin, and he's not morally responsible for sin. He's still in charge here. 
He created this world. Verse 22, it says, What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, had endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory? All right, so he created this world. What if he just decided, hey, I've decided to make this pot, and even though I'm going to throw it away at the end of the day, I'm not going to do it now. And that shows how glorious I am because this pot is useless to me, but for right now, it's just going to sit here. And right now, I'm, I'm going to withhold my wrath on sinful creation, uh, creation so that the glory of God can be declared to all. Does that make sense? That's exactly what he says is going on here. Do you realize that's why you're still sitting here? Because he's decided not to show his wrath on the world yet. <laughs> Some of you are like, Oh, <laughs> that means God has mercy on us. God shows grace to us every moment you take a breath. Holy smokes, this is amazing. God loves us. He cares for us. He does everything that needs to happen. It's difficult for us to understand this because we think that God owes us salvation. But really, God can do all that he wants. God is sovereign. God has a supreme will. He, can, he is the potter who can mold the clay as he sees fit. He can also work with sinners as he sees fit. He can choose to exercise great patience toward those headed with, for destruction. And what does that mean? That is a gracious God. Because we don't deserve anything. And yet he is exhibiting patience no matter what. He's showing that God's discipline is actually a tool of mercy. It brings people to a place of repentance. Whew! Imagine? I mean, Jesus, man, the fact that God hasn't destroyed us shows us that he still cares and that he still has a plan and that he's still working out salvation in some people. He's still drawing people to him. I don't know who God has chosen, but I still got to tell people, hey, look, God loves you. You need to repent no matter what, right? That's the task of those that have experienced his mercy. Hey, look, God has shown me mercy. He will show you mercy as well. In his grace and mercy, God is calling people to himself. It doesn't matter if they're Jews or Gentiles, historical Israel or the new Israel. He's calling them to himself. Verse 24, he says, uh, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. As indeed he says in Hosea, those who were not my people, I will call my people. And her who was not beloved, I will call beloved. And in a very place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they will be called sons of the living God. See what he's saying? He's snatching people up. He's saying, hey, yeah, you, you're in, you, you're in, you, you're in. And he's still showing his mercy. He's still proclaiming his great love and justice to others. That's pretty amazing. He is calling a sinful people to himself. Just like when he saved Israel, he showed mercy to the undeserving. He does it to us each and every day. For those who will repent, those who will listen to that call, he's rescuing us. He's making us a useful pot, a pot that can be used right now. He shows undeserved mercy to those who are not his people beforehand. And most of us, we start there. We start where we're not his people. You may hear a sinner ever, yeah. Okay, yeah, most of us. You may hear mess up ever, yeah. Most of, I, me, okay, all right. I don't deserve this mercy. I don't deserve the grace that God has shown me. But in his sovereign will, he has chose me and rescued me. And now he's using me personally to proclaim the truth that mercy is still available to you, that you too can be rescued. So is God fair? Well, if we define fairness as all things being equal, of course not. God does not give everybody everything exactly the same, right? Some of you have hair. And not, that's not fair. But if we just define fairness as the idea, as, as our standards of good and evil, is that going to work out? No, because God isn't bound by our standards of good and evil. I think it would be good if I was a multimillionaire right now, right? 
and yet it's not happening for whatever reason, right? But no, it's, it's, so sometimes it's not fair by our own perspective. Fairness can never be measured by our own perspective because we are just simply the pot. We are simply to be used by God however he sees fit. We do not determine what we are to be used for. Our purpose is not to forge our own pathway, but to determine or even to determine exactly what it is that we want to be. Our purpose is to be used by the creator of the universe for his benefit and for his glory. Thank goodness. That makes life a little bit easier. You don't have to worry so much about all that. You just say, God, use me. Show me where it's next. Next step. All right, let's go and let's move. God, I trust you. Help me to see what's next and let's go. God, use me here. Use me in this situation. Use me at work. Use me in my marriage. Use me with my kids. Help me to continue to proclaim your greatness, God, because I want to be in a pot that proclaims the glory of God till I am no longer useful, right? That's what the life is about. That's what we're here for. And we start that process by repenting, by admitting who we are. We're sinners. We're far from God. We're useless. We believe that Jesus is exactly who he said he was, the one who came to rescue us. We believe in Jesus. We come to him, and through faith in Jesus alone, we become followers of Christ. Like the grace of God, he can rescue us. We have faith in him. We confess that Jesus is Lord from that point on. And then when God rescues us, he is being absolutely just. He's delaying punishment even now so that we can all experience his good grace. This is the unmerited favor, the goodness that we don't deserve. By grace alone, he comes to us to rescue us. By faith alone, we respond to him. So God is just. While it may not look like fair, he is just because he doesn't have to give us anything. A loving God is a just God. A sovereign God is a trustworthy God. My circumstance can never define who God is or how God should act. We need Jesus to show us this God. We need to see a picture of what this looks like. What does it look like to trust in God completely? Well, Jesus was given to us to show us that. In Philippians 2, I love this, and I think I try to say this every single time I come up here. But in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, he says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Be like Jesus. Think like this. Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. What does he do? He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is what we're looking at. We look to Jesus. We trust in Jesus because he ha- his sovereign will knows best. So we trust him. We humble ourselves like him. We just admit, hey, we don't get all the answers. I don't understand everything about this. And Paul is confusing at times. But we trust Jesus, who was obedient all the way to death. Obedient all to cost him everything in his physical life. And what happened to Jesus? He's exalted. Lifted up. And now because of Jesus, we can come to, to, to God. We are restored. We are rescued if we trust Christ alone. This is how we know that God is who he says he is and how we know that God does what he says he does because of what happened in the life of Jesus. This is how we trust God. We trust him through Jesus alone. So will you trust him? Some of you have done this for years. Great. Remember this. Proclaim this. Some of you have never done that before. Start. Jesus, I trust in you. There you go. That's the beginning. And then let us know about it. Put it on your connection card. Say, hey, today I trusted Jesus. We'd love to talk to you more about that. But we have to trust God. We have to know that God is sovereign. Let me pray for us. God, thank you that you are in control.